there is also the issue of aligning your local data model in Wikibase to Wikidata. Uh, so if you would like data to flow between them or correlate them in some way, alignments are not always present or obvious. Um, naturally, this is part of the impact of your, part of the reason to create a Wikibase instance, but increasing the impact of your Wikibase data by including it in Wikidata is a kind of a natural inclination, I think, to kind of share this data back out to the community. Um, uh, but that could be really a, a difficult proposition. Uh, overall, I would argue that the difficulty level of this use case is advanced. Um, I'm going to make a few comments about uh, Wikibase setup, uh, just generally, just to say uh, how easy it was or not easy it was. Um, and I am not uh, not really that uh, kind of technical, uh, don't have that much of a technical background, uh, so I rely extensively on this documentation in particular, so I did want to call it out and just thank those people who actually create the technical documentation and that people are able to walk through these things step by step. Um, so definitely Stacy and Dan Scott um, and Matt Miller and people at Vanderbilt University and of course um, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation for its documentation as well. Uh, it's super easy. Uh, that is to say, I ended up doing it, but it's not easy. <laughs> if you don't know virtual machines and Docker very well. All right. So uh, one thing that we, we thought would be a good idea, I think a lot of, uh, it seems like looking at other projects, this is where a lot of other people start, is um, yes, you just kind of have a, your own Wikibase and then Wikidata already has property for that, so why don't I just import that in? So that's kind of uh, maybe where we, we thought we would start to do some of that. Um, but my experience of practically trying to do that is that you uh, very quickly lose control of your data model. Um, so we're kind of trying to finally kind of craft a particular data model that meets a particular use case. Uh, but when we tried to, when I tried to import uh, Ontario because I was like, well, let's have these provincial associations associated with these uh, communities, um, I ended up importing uh, all of these other types of properties. So all of a sudden, motto text was part of the data model. I didn't really want motto text, but it was there from the provincial data that was coming in. So uh, that's something that's just like this huge fire goes that if you start to turn it on, then you can't really necessarily control it that well. Um, another one I've already talked about, but of course Wikidata will change, and if we're talking about this kind of fluid model, our local Wikibase would change, so how do you kind of keep those in alignment? And there's probably ways to do that, but, uh, but that's also, also an issue. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, could lead to undesired compromises. Um, uh, so I think there's something to be said for thinking more directly and purely about your use case as opposed to creating a data model in relationship to all of these established properties that were in Wikidata. Um, and I uh, think especially in our in our use case, we don't necessarily want to create it kind of as a side <laughs> add-on to what's already in Wikidata. We want to kind of recreate that, that data model and center indigenous worldviews. Um, so yeah, so I think, and especially those things in Wikidata that have been imported by bots or you know, uh, from Wikipedia, sometimes there just hasn't been very much oversight of those things. So why would you kind of create your, your data model based on those things? All right, and we have a bunch of questions. So this is this is the start of our discussion point. I don't know how much time we have left, but so we have a lot of questions uh, that's come up with starting to do this work. I think um, we feel like this is a good pathway for this. Certainly, we think linked data makes a lot of sense for the kinds of uh, things that we're producing. Wikibase seems like an obvious choice. But it does open up um, a lot of questions. Uh, as Dean just pointed to, how does this? Uh, how do we create uh, sustainability and tools? Um, what does this community-based, distributed thing look like? How is that going to work? Um, and I'll just also say, I mean, just to be really realistic about this project. So we're uh, all of us that are involved. This is all service work. If you're working in an academic library, if you're in a tenure system, you know what that means. You have your sort of categories of your work. So this is none for none of us. This is not actually our job. So that adds uh, an additional um, layer of uh, sort of issues just around um, resources. So that um, how do we do this work in a really lightweight but responsible way? And then how do we sort of introduce uh, uh, sustainability when there's also a recognition from this community that the there is not a great um, desire to do this work tightly in collaboration with institutions because that's uh, it's actually the opposite. So 
Um, this is this presents some very real challenges to to um, this work. So um, yeah, just would love to hear um, others. You know, not again. You know, necessarily the specific use case, but if there's others who are working in this context, uh, it'd be great to sort of have a discussion. Oh, we have 15 minutes. Hi, thanks. This, this looks very wonderful, and a lot of it reminds me of Mukitu. Uh So I'm curious, are you talking with them, collaborating, um, sharing? Yeah, I mean, so for those who know the traditional knowledge labels, I mean, those are um, more for, uh, like, objects. So controlling use of objects in a digital environment. So certainly there is some alignment, but this is really also very um, specific to our context in Canada. So we're really trying to look at what do we, um, you know, we're starting with naming. And the traditional knowledge label labels are not really about naming specifically, but I think that what going forward that will be that. So that's obviously in the same uh, realm of relationship in terms of recognizing the importance of centering indigenous people in our uh, systems. But I think that there, those things can work together really nicely, and I think that that, that would be awesome. Hi. So I have a question actually about the knowledge base and sort of indigenous control of it, but also if you thought about it as a tool for um, education of non-native peoples who may be describing materials in their collection that were produced by indigenous communities. Um, thinking about um, some of Dorothy's comments in the keynote yesterday, um, where there is this issue of, you know, it may not be ill-intentioned, but it has the same effect, and how do you educate people so that you can avoid some of those problems? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and I know in the, in the data that we're collecting that there is context being, um, you know, why this is this place name, this is something about what the name means, and also um, links, obviously, to where some of the provenance is, so some of the um, data sources are actually, you know, in this work are land claims, for example. So when we talk about who's uh, like a territory or a space, that, um, and this is where it does get you know, it, it's it's an issue because this gets it gets political. It's political. We're talking about about sovereignty. We're talking about land. We're talking about identity. And so it could be that different uh, nations and the government and all claim the same space. So we're not saying that this is you know the the intention is not to say well this is the one this is this this you know organization's land or this nation's land, but we have to say this is according to this documentation, this is what it says about the, this particular land. But it, it I mean, I, so hopefully, but it, but it opens up a lot of problems when we talk, I mean, we, I think we tend to gloss over that in our, because we have this need to say that one thing is, you know, this is the name, this is the thing, and we just, as catalogers, <coughs> and I work in the student learning department, uh, you know, as catalogers we say, I have to make a choice, I have to make a decision, I have to follow the rules, and this is what it says I have to do. But we know that there's all this complexity to the world. So I think there's a lot to work out there, but it could it hopefully will eat up that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a little bit of a mind shift in terms of embracing that fluid. That's why I talked about fluidity so much and that complexity. And uh, if we are saying truly that the communities are in control of this language, that means it could change at any time. And we have to be okay with that, and we have to adjust. That we can't expect everybody to adjust to what we're doing. So I think that's kind of that's part of the part of the reason we would do this in the first place is that we and kind of so I think it's it is a fundamental shift in terms of embracing that fluidity that we're not really used to. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I was particularly interested in your slide about uh, the advantages of using Wikibase as opposed to Wikidata. Um, and one of the bullet points you had there was control, and I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. I'm particularly interested to know if you went so far as to be able to control, um, to, to sort of lock down certain parts of the, the information space, for example, um, items which you didn't want to be deleted, but which you were happy for people to 
um, add information to or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's the part we haven't worked yet. But but uh, but yeah. So that so that'll be that'll be the question. How do we uh, allow for um, contributions? Um, and then there's going to be some level of vetting that's going to have to happen, and it's going to have to be certain kinds of members of, you know, the nice thing about doing this this project is like the person who worked on the none of it section lives in none of it, and she is, that's her community, so she has a, a perspective on that data in a way that I certainly don't, I have, I have never been there, I don't know the, the people, I don't know the community, so, so being able to also say, the person who's going to be vetting this, or the way that we establish this, is going to be the people who understand that context somewhat. But it, yeah, so that's going to be one of the challenges. And then we can look to some of the way that other repositories do some of that work as far as um, user kind of uh, controls. But we'll see. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the most so something like this could be done in Wikidata, of course, and so yeah, so we're so we're we're thinking more uh, control in terms of um, we want to make sure that the actors they are actually acting in good faith and <laughs> are actually kind of representing those communities from a particular point of view. Uh, so that's you know that's all we have. Yeah, I think it's good just to recognize. I don't, you know, I think that we've seen some of this in the United States, but people get um, people have feelings about things in their world about their <laughs> statues and um, spaces and places and when uh, we do things like take them down or change names that causes a lot of feelings and so um, you know it's about about valuing something but also about thinking about how to keep the community safe and I think that's something to consider as well as like we don't want to be doing this to expose people to um, to really or violence or that kind of thing, so that's definitely a consideration as well, but that we can't be doing something that seems like it's good, but then open up um, a whole other set of, of problems for folks. Uh, I was thinking some of the issues and challenges you put forward are those that Washington State had previously experienced with the Plateau peoples. Um, you know, where only the people from that indigenous group could actually change the names, and some of them were completely misnamed and so forth. Anyone could view the information, but they had strict controls over who could add, who could edit, and so forth. So you're nodding your head, so you're familiar with that. Because I was thinking this might be the next, you could probably, possibly adapt some of their procedures into the wiki-based environment. And it also reminded me that some of the indigenous groups, indigenous peoples in Canada overlap with yeah. those in having, you know, we were the ones who did the border. They had nothing to do with that. So Cree, for example, yeah. is a you know, north, south, and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my own ancestors come actually from both sides. Actually, my ancestors had to move uh, after the War of 1812 um, because the land that they were living on was uh, ceded to the United States. And, so they actually um, all moved uh, to, you know, to the other side of this arbitrary border. So absolutely, when we talk about this space, it's really thinking about decolonization in that it's not about recognizing these sort of political borders. And I even, you know, we hesitate to even say, when we talk about nationality, I mean, many indigenous people don't identify as Canadian because that's not their nation. That's not their nation, their experience of nationhood. So we have to think about how all these conceptual categories uh, might work in this in this system to, to recognize exactly that, that these, these borders are, are only one set of ideas of how the world is. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, let me mention. Uh, so the first question y'all had about how to incorporate this into the library and archival work. Um, so my, my project in particular, my institution, we've been using post-custodialism. Um, in particular, over the years, has been developing more as a way to do distributive justice and trying to hand over power to our partners. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily the solution for this question, um, but we have noticed that in having our partners create our metadata, we've been able to uh, address issues around deciding much better because then we give agency to our partners to decide 
um, in particular also because they define how to phrase things. We've also been able to kind of look back at our collections and think about, well, what, how would we term this when our partners are the subject specialists, right? Um, and it's over the years changed a lot more into this idea that they are stakeholders, that they're not just a population that we're studying or a group that we're working with for a set time, that they are 100% partner stakeholders. And they define from the very beginning of the par partnership how to move forward with our consultation of either archival expertise or library expertise. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like great and, and a really good model um, to follow. So, just one, I'm going again, but I, in 2005, I worked with the Norman Spring Chip Center in Rock Ontario to build that library. I'm not built, but they built it, but I have to come in the catalog. I wish we had this, you know, we had Brian be a classification then, but we couldn't use that because it was a soft name, which we can only see that in 1950, so we end up having to use a term. You know, we will never use a jig way. The people were uh, Anishina Bay and the old man and Anishina. So, and we had to get smashed and we go into a heavy day. And then we had to burn something in the library before you work everything before. So, but I'm, I'm like, so I think with the amount of friendship centers in Canada, if you can make it easy for them to do it, and really, that's really have them as a stakeholder, like you know, she mentioned, I, I, wish I, I wish we had that in 2005, so thank you. I hope Brian, your classification, get into this one. Yeah, I mean, we are, um, there will be some classification work coming, which we've done some of this uh, work. Um, but yeah, so if, just as a shout out to, um, if you don't know uh, Brian Deere, um, who developed this classification system, he just uh, passed away um, this past uh, February, I think. So um, definitely, uh, you know, a leader in moving away from from um, a Western concept around how libraries are organized. But yeah, I mean, it, this is actually responding exactly to that, that kind of uh, need. And we do have a, a number of uh, librarians in our group, um, not specifically the red team necessarily, but in the, the larger group who are librarians at First Nations uh, libraries, including um, um, Six Nations. So, you know, it is about responding to those, to those needs, both in academic libraries, but but to community uh, as well, and using our um, resources and time and space that we have to be able to do this this work for for those who might not have those uh, those resources. And we do um, at the University of Victoria, we do the cataloging for our local Victoria Native Friendship Center, and uh, we're kind of transitioning so uh, to a different model where they do more of the description of themselves and they're able to do it themselves, and but uh, just providing that scaffolding so that any kind of expertise we can offer, there's kind of a, uh, a mindset that's required of just openly giving your gifts, and uh, the community can take them or they can't, and being okay with that, so, yeah, we can see. I have one more question, especially for Brian, but I don't see any questions, so maybe, um, agenda is lunch and then we're moving um, directly into the birds of a feather so if you haven't uh, checked out the program or refreshed it on your device uh, do please do that to check out um, what's going on so I think we have half an hour to grab lunch and move about and then uh, re re reassemble um, places. so once again thanks to this panel for talking about wiki data and wiki